five loaves, the two fish didn't make it. <laughs> Good morning! Good morning! I had you to do it this morning as we continue our series on broken things. Man, I have certainly, I knew that a lot of people were broken. I don't guess I was so aware of how many people are hurting today because of health, because of finances, because of whatever. And it certainly falls in with our Cancer Awareness Month. February is our Cancer Awareness Month. And so uh, if you are a cancer survivor, would you stand for a moment? Continue standing. If you're a cancer survivor, would you stand? Caregiver, would you stand with them? Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. That is why we do our Cancer Awareness Month, is because there are so many people affected in some form or another with cancer. And if your family hasn't been affected, it will. It will. Eventually, it will be affected. It is also why I'm continuing this series. Uh, I wear purple this morning for just cancer. And then my tie, I chose it. I thought, I don't really care whether it matches my purple shirt or not. Because it covers so many colors of different categories of cancer. And then, for some reason, I have a special attachment to the pink ribbon that I wear also. So, uh, we will have, uh, Dr. Bowers will be here next week. He will talk for a few moments next week. We're always glad to have him. Dr. Pippen has been coming the last several years. We'll not make it this year for February. He's going to come in uh, October which is cancer, uh, which is Breast Awareness uh, Cancer Month, and he's going to come in uh, October. Okay, just a quick overview. Remember that there are times in our life that we are bent. And we don't like being bent. But being bent is not broken. When you are bent, you're going to spring back. When you are broken, you are not going to spring back. And there's nothing wrong with that. Have people say, well, Brother Roger, you ought to just spring back. Well, good luck. <laughs> Maybe you can. But it's taken me a little while to spring back. Okay, for the last four weeks, I have made the statement, people use duct tape to fix everything, but God used nails. When we are broken, we try to repair the broken part of our lives with duct tape. People think that we are fixed when we use the duct tape, but we're not. And eventually, the duct tape comes off, and when the duct tape comes off, it's obvious that we are not fixed. Now, the other thing is, when God repairs us, we take all the pieces to Him, he leaves scars. Something else. Duct tape cannot fix broken people. Duct tape cannot fix broken people. Amen? Amen. Can't do it. It's a very temporary fix. Also remember that, like I said, God often leaves the scars. He leaves the scars for us to remember that He has repaired our broken lives. The first week in our study of broken things, our example was a broken preacher by the name of Timothy. The next week, our example was broken pictures. The uh, next week, our example was a broken roof. Last week, our example was a broken ship. This week, our example is going to be broken bread. That the Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he broke it 
And he passed it out to 5,000 men. Okay. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 21, in these verses I see, hear me this morning, four different stories. We're going to pause with each one of these stories and talk about each one of them briefly, but I see in the verses we're about to read four different stories. And already you're thinking, well, Roger, I've got to be home by kickoff. <laughs> you will be. Okay. If you don't mind standing with me this morning as we read our starting verses. Matthew 14, 1. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the news about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before him and pleased him. So much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oath and because of his dinner guests. Verse 10, He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. Let us pause. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, Cancer Awareness Month, we're more aware of cancer as it, as it grows. But Father, you are the great physician and there's nothing you cannot do. Father, give us comfort and peace as we go through this week, especially. Now, bless us with your word, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to see something here that when Herod had John beheaded, it says that it grieved him. You read that? He wanted it. John the Baptist dead, but over a period of time he had grown accustomed and even a favoritism, if you will, to John. So when he had John beheaded and killed him, of course, he was grieved. But when you really look at the word there, grieved, he wasn't broken, he was bent. What? Herod was bent that he put John to death. He wasn't broken. He sprung right back. Are you with me? Amen? Amen. All right. So I see King Herod as being bent. We are told that he grieved over the matter, but he was not broken. He put duct tape on his grief, and he went on. And before long, he was doing something else entirely. <laughs> the next verses tell us that Jesus, that John the Baptist's disciples came and got the body of John and they uh, were buried him. Now, the disciples of John were not bent. They were broken. Hair was bent. The disciples of John were broken and they took the body and they buried it. Alright, look at verse 12. His disciples came and took away the body and buried it and they went. Oh, this is the reason we know they were broken. And they did what? 
and they reported to Jesus. Let me tell you, when you are broken, one of the things you do is you go to Jesus and you tell Jesus all about it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Man, when I'm broken, I want to hit my knees and say, Lord, did you know and he I know. And Roger, I'm there with you. And I understand. I'm there. And I weep and I cry because I'm broken. The disciples of John were broken. And they went and told Jesus. Isn't that, isn't that great? Isn't that good? They went and told Jesus. How often do you get bent that you spring back and you don't go to the Lord? But when you're broken, you go to the Lord. Lord, I'm broken. So that's what they did. They went and told Jesus. That's what verse 12 said. The old hymn says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer. Amen. The best part of that is I like when it says, Oh, what needless pain we bear. See, John had taught his disciples well. He had taught them, when you are broken, go to Jesus. And that's what they did. And they didn't have to bear the pain alone. They carried their broken pieces to the Lord and said, Here, Lord, here's my broken pieces. Okay, another, the third story. Verse 13. Now, when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from them in a boat to a secluded place by himself. Oh, brother and sister, hear me this morning. This here is good stuff, and it's easy to overlook. Jesus heard about John, and he withdrew to a place by himself. Now, another translation says that his disciples were with him. Normally, hear me, normally when Jesus withdraws to somewhere by himself, it says he prayed. He doesn't say so here. Well, he did. How do you know he did? Let me tell you, there's times that when we are broken, we want to be by ourselves and absorb all of what was going on. Jesus, probably, got by himself to reminisce about all that went on. After all, Jesus, listen to me, Jesus had lost a colleague. He lost a family member. John was related. Amen? Oh, I forgot about that one. So he was a colleague, he was a family member, and they were just close. They grew up together in some form. Can you imagine Jesus sitting out here by himself going, you know what, I remember when John and I did whatever. Guess what's wrong with reminiscing? Nothing. You can do it too long or whatever. You can think about something, but overall, I love that. Herod wasn't broken. He was just bent. The disciples were broken. They took it to Jesus. Jesus heard about it. And you say, well, Jesus was God. He knew about it, but he's still. Let me tell you. Somebody asked me the other day, he said, well, didn't Jesus know that John was going to be headed? Beheaded? Yes, he did. But let me throw something at you. I knew Judy was going to die. But you know what? When she did, oh, that's okay. I knew she was going to die anyway. No. No, what? It's still, it's like, my crap, don't do you chase you. So Jesus knew that John was going to die. That was part of the overall plan, but when it actually happened, it took place. He needed to get off by himself for a few moments. But he didn't get to be alone very long. But in my opinion, Herod was not broken. He was bent. The disciples were broken. Jesus was broken in that sin caused John to be beheaded. Are you with me? Why is in this chapter?
got to listen to. Why is in this chapter we find Jesus alone? Most of the time we find Jesus alone in prayer. Not this time. But this is a time that he was just alone. Probably with his disciples. The news of the death of John must have been disturbing. If Jesus needed a moment to reflect, you know you and I do. Okay? Yeah. All right, let's go on a little further. Jesus needed a moment to reflect about John. We need time to reflect about a loss of a loved one. But then, oh, life goes not the same, but a lot goes on. Telling somebody at the hospital the other day, they said, well, we're, we're new in the community in, in the McKinney area. They said, we're looking for a church. I said, let me guess. You're looking for one just like you left. I, we are. I said, well, guess what? You're not going to find one just like you left. You might find one worse, and you may find one better, but you're not going to find one just like. Why not? Because you're looking at different people, a different preacher, a different neighborhood. It's not going to be the same. Let me tell you, life goes on, but it's not the same. All right. Verse 13. Let's go a little further. 13, the last part. And when the people heard of this, what did they hear of? They heard that Jesus would, had withdrawn to himself. They followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate. And Jesus goes, oh, no kidding. No, I don't think that's what it's at. <laughs> and the hour is already late. So send the crowd away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. First thing I want you to see there is that it says that Jesus saw the crowd. <clears throat> Hear me. Jesus, it says Jesus saw the crowd. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd. When you look deeper in that word, saw, he saw the crowd. He didn't just glance at the crowd. He saw the crowd. He saw them as individuals. Listen, that's important. We are to see people, right? No matter how large the congregation is, we ought to see people. And Jesus looked on the crowd, saw the people, and when he saw, truly saw, what was happening in their heart and in their mind, when he truly saw the people, he had compassion. He had compassion. Uh, let me tell you, you can be in a cancer ward at Baylor or anywhere else, unless you see the individual, you don't have compassion for them. We are to see the individual as an individual and have compassion. Yeah. I think it's interesting, and I've said this many times, that either the word compassion is used by Jesus or about Jesus. When you read the New Testament, you find every time compassion is used, Jesus is using it or it's used about it. Because in my feeble mind, when you really look at compassion, only Jesus has compassion. We make a stab at it, but Jesus had compassion for this crowd because he saw individuals and he saw them hurting. And then, because he saw compassion, he reacted and he healed their sin. Now listen, you do not have compassion unless you are willing to put finances or feet to it. Unless you put action on it, it is not compassion. Jesus. 
Jesus had compassion for the group and he healed their sin. We say, well, Roger, I can't heal anybody. No, but if you have compassion for somebody, you can pray for them. You can put medicine on them. You can listen to them. You can do what you can do. Yeah, there you go. You can do what you can do. Compassion for them. And because of the compassion, he healed their sick. All right. Now think about this. The idea is here that he healed all of them. Which ones? All of them. Well, what if they had so-and-so? He healed them. Well, now, you, are you telling me that he healed? He healed all of them. Amen. By the end of the day, no one there of that 5,000 plus was sick of anything. <coughs> of any. Dr. Charles Ryrie says that according to what he understands in Jesus' healing, that he healed, not like TV healers, he healed. He could grow hair on a bald man's head if he needed it. He could fill the cavities out and put new teeth if they needed it. There was nothing he could not do. Try seeing somebody on TV do those. Jesus healed everybody. 5,000, remember how many was there? Probably about 15, 14,000 were there. And whatever they had, broken legs, it didn't matter. Whatever the problem was, he healed them. Whew, what a great verse. All their sick, whatever the problem, was all healed. Now, I'm reading into this just a little bit. But then the disciples, they're standing here watching Jesus heal this one, that one, this one, that one. You know, they carried some to him and he healed those. He healed everybody. Then the disciples said, well, Lord, you've healed all of them, but you can't feed them. Is that not what they said? That's what he was saying. You've healed all these people of all these diseases, but you can't feed them. So we need to send them away where they get something to eat. Oh, uh, it sounds like me and you, really. They went, uh, look at verse 16. Uh, but Jesus said to them, and this is one of the greatest verses in all Scripture, they do not need to go away. You feed them. <laughs> I love that verse. I would have loved to have been there and watched the disciples. What? What? Wait, wait, me? You want me to feed? Lord, do you know how many people are out there? And you want me to feed them? Lord, I got more faith in you now. You feed them. I love that. That's got to be. They were face to face. Hear me. They were face to face with the supreme power of the universe, and yet they were spiritually blind. How many times has every believer faced a crisis that seemed overwhelming and failed to consider the Lord's power? <sighs> Lord, I know you can heal everybody else, but can you heal me? Well, yeah, you can if you so choose. There's nothing he cannot do. All things are possible with our Lord. All things are possible with our Lord. And then somebody would say, well, he didn't heal Judy. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yeah. And you know what? She never, ever has to be sick again. Amen. If you think about Lazarus. Lazarus was healed, brought back from the dead. But guess what Lazarus had to do again? Die. I could just see Lazarus when they brought him back, when the Lord brought him back. Are you kidding, Lord? <laughs> you want me to do what? And eventually Lazarus died again. 
How many times has every believer faced a crisis that seemed overwhelming and they didn't even consider the power of the Lord? The disciples' problem is our problem. They were looking only with human eyes and only with human resources. They were looking with human eyes and human resources. Oh man, it gets even better. This is a great story. Matthew 17, uh, 14, 17. They said to him, we have only three, I have only five loaves and two fish. The story about feeding the 5,000 is told in all four gospel writers, but only John tells us where the loaves and fish came from. John 6, 8. John 6, 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But well, what are these uh, for so many people? Now, a lad is, was considered a younger, maybe early teens, not really sure exactly how old, but he was a young boy. Probably a young boy could eat two fish and five loaves all by himself. You know some empty teenagers? <laughs> and here they are, and they bring this to Jesus. Here it is. This is all we got. We searched the crowd. In fact, one of the Gospels even mentions searching. Go, Jesus said, go find what you can. They came back with five loaves. Probably something about this side. Now, barley was for the common person. Barley was cheap. And they would make bread out of barley, and it was cheap, so therefore the common man had barley bread. And they brought it to Jesus. All right. Andrew reported to Jesus that he, his search had revealed five barley loaves and two fish. First of all, barley was the food of the common man. So by that we see this young boy, common, Nothing unusual except the boy had one thing unusual about him. He had food in the way else did. <laughs> he was just a boy. So nothing special about him. Well, what's the neat about that? Hear me. Some of you don't like very excited. The ball came away. We'll, we'll get there. You haven't heard cowboys are not playing. Not playing. It is neat to me that God can use a common individual of no special. Amen. That means he can use you and me. He used this boy that doesn't even name him. But it dates what he had. He had five barley loaves and two fish. Now remember, they're looking out over this crowd of that minimum. Of 5,000. The boy is common. But now, I have some questions. You ever thought about where is the boy's parents? You ever think about that? <laughs> Don't laugh. There's a few times some of your kids I wonder, where are their parents? <laughs> <laughs> My God would never do that. It's all Tiffany's fault, right? <laughs> Where's the boy's parents? I don't know. We're not told. We're not told anything about the parents. But I'm going to tell you something about the parents. This mother and dad, or at least one of them, was concerned enough about the boy that they wanted him fed in two different ways. What? They wanted him physically fed. She said what? Five. Two. She wanted him fed spiritually too. She sent him to hear Jesus. Woo, man. We take care of our children and we feed them physically and we feed them spiritually and they are not complete without both. Amen. Man, Lord, is blessed me with this, this study. Maybe I need it worse than anybody else. This is I love 
this. They were concerned about their boy, physically and spiritually. They sent him off that morning with food for the body and food for the soul when he got there. Let me tell you something else the boy had. The boy had a gracious heart that he learned at home. He learned at home to share. Boy, you got the only food of this whole 5,000. Will you share it? And the boy basically must have it. You do not read that he kept one loaf and gave five. You do not read, because I know a few that would cram half fish in his mouth and go. <laughs> None of that. The boy must have said here, take what little I have and give to the Lord. Take what little I have and give to the Lord. Notice too, the boy wasn't worried about, well, that's mine. You can't have it. He gave it away freely. And he wasn't worried about himself. Hear me this morning. We as a whole are so greedy with what little we've got. Well, Roger, I've got no. What, what you've got is little. This boy gave five barley loaves, two fish to the Lord. Let me tell you, when we give to the Lord, He's going to multiply it. Just the way it is. Wow. Only a few in the crowd knew the lamb at all. I don't know if anybody knew the lamb, but only a few in the crowd of 5,000 knew the Lord. You know what? It's not important that people know us. It's important that the Lord knows what we do, and He does. It doesn't matter whether anybody else knows what you have done or doing. It doesn't matter. The Lord does. So very few in the crowd knew what the boy had done at all. Okay. We need to remember that our broken lives are so small until the Lord multiplies the pieces. He does the increasing when we do the giving. He does the increasing when we do the giving. He does the increasing when we do the giving. And we will be whole again. Amen. Next verse. Uh, but Jesus said to them, Do not send them away. Verse 17 said to him, We have only five loaves. Oh, look at verse 18. And he said, Bring them to me. Hear me. How often has the Lord said to you with your broken pieces, Bring them to me? It's not good enough for you just to have them broken. You gotta take them to him. Bring them to me. Bring them. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. And he could have just as easily got the bread from the boy himself. He said, bring, bring it. I'll take it. See, we have a part to play, and that part is bring them here to the Lord. Mm. Wow. Okay, let's wrap this up. Verse 28. Verse 20. Uh, 19. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, they took the five loaves and the two fish, and lifting up towards heaven, he blessed the food, and breaking the loaves, he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. And they all ate. Oh, listen to this. They all ate and were what? You might want to underline that word satisfied. Because it's an important word. You do not read satisfied very often in Scripture. They ate 
what Jesus had given to them, and they were satisfied. Let me tell you, when Jesus gives to you his life and we accept it, we are satisfied spiritually. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. Listen, the disciples had leftovers the next day. Some of you were looking at me like that. <laughs> Don't miss that. Listen to the truth. And they were all satisfied. They picked up what was left over the broken pieces, 12 full baskets, verse 21. There, there were about 5,000 men who ate, besides women and children. So we know there was 5,000 men. All of them did not bring wives. All of them didn't have children, but you can figure there's at least another 5,000. So a minimum of 10, 15,000 there. They were satisfied. Only the Lord can satisfy. And then the broken pieces were picked up. Oh Lord, thank you for picking up my broken pieces. There was more that was left than was passed out. Then when the Lord took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, and then he began to pass it out. Now, I don't know about you, but as I heard somebody say, well, that wouldn't be a good girl. The Lord in his hands fed 5,000 plus. <coughs> oh, but there's a just a tad more I want you to see. Church, can't you hear the Lord telling you, bring them? Jesus would say soon after this, back in John's Gospel, soon after this, Jesus would say, I am the bread of life. And if you eat this bread that I give you, you will never hunger again. I am the bread of life. And Jesus had to be broken on the cross to be the bread of life and pass it out. He couldn't be the bread of life until he was broken. And he passed it. Oh, hear me. Oh, no. When the little boy, all by himself, perhaps, took the bread, gave to the disciples, he affected <coughs> 10,000 people. When the Lord, Chris, died on the cross and he was the bread of life, he affected an entire world. Amen. Amen. This is the second or third time I've thought about this and I'm still excited. What's wrong with you? <laughs> he became the bread of life and, and shared it with the world. Listen. When we give our little bit to the Lord, we're going to affect hundreds, if not thousands. And they may never know who we are but the Lord. Yeah. I want you to look at John 6.35 and it says, Jesus said to them, I am. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never Now, this morning, you have an opportunity because he's passing out the bread for Jesus himself. And he's passing it out. And I, I hate because there's so many in this world that just not in us. You cannot come to heaven without the bread. And there are those who say, well, I'll, I'll take it next week or I'll take it next month or I'll take it tomorrow. You don't know that you don't need it. You don't know that you're going to be around the day after tomorrow. So the time is come. Isn't it? We 
Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for this day and the blessing of these four stories that you've given us. We, we see the, the bent, the broken. We see the meditation. We see the, the way you take so little and make it so much. Maybe there's someone here this morning that needs the bread or wine. May they come. We thank you, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.